Welcome everyone to our webinar, Building Momentum, Your Role in Influencing Canada's National Codes and Preventing Falls in Homes, facilitated by the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Mariel Ang, and I am the Project Coordinator at the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. ONF sponsors the Fall Prevention Community of Practice and its online platform called Loop. Loop is a place where fall prevention practitioners connect. Visit us at www.fallsloop.com. Marguerite Thomas also joins us on the line. Marguerite is the liaison for the Fall Pre Prevention Community of Practice. She will be assisting with facilitating questions in the chat box today. Before we begin, I'm going to give you a quick rundown on the Level 3 meeting system. This webinar technology consists of two parts. The audio is provided through a telephone conference line, and the visuals are provided through a web platform. The phone number for the conference line and the link to the web platform were sent to you by email after you registered for the webinar through Level 3. If you have a question about the technology at any time during the presentation, please type them into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. Alternatively, you can email me at mariel at onf.org. That's M-A-R-I-E-L at onf.org. I will work with you to resolve technical issues as soon as possible. This webinar will contain opportunities for participation. There will be an online poll throughout the presentation where you will answer directly on your screen and a question and answer period at the end. If you have topic-related questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box. During the Q&A, questions will be read aloud to the group. If you would prefer to ask your question over the phone, we will provide the instructions to unmute your line during the Q&A. The webinar is being recorded and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants in about one week along with the presentation slides. I would now like to introduce our presenters, Linda and Jake. Linda Strobel is a public health nurse in the Injury Prevention Program for the City of Hamilton, where she has worked for 30 years. She is a member of the Canadian National Building Code Standing Committee on Housing and Small Buildings, the STAIR Task Group, and Chair of the Joint Grab Bar Task Group. In 2015, she was the inaugural recipient of the CPHA's R. Sterling Ferguson Award for her contributions to public health. Jake Pauls is a certified professional ergonomist based in Toronto. He has over 51 years of worldwide experience in research, codes, and standards development, plus consulting linking architecture, ergonomics, public health, and law, especially in relation to falls. For eight of his 13 U.S. Safety Standards Committee memberships, he formally represents the American Public Health Association. In 2017, the University of Greenwich conferred an honorary Doctor of Science degree for his contributions to building use and safety, including about 150 publications, hundreds of presentations, 30 videos, and significant revisions to many model building codes and widely used standards. Without further ado, please take it away, Linda and Jake. Thank you. Hello and welcome to everyone. I'm so glad you could join us today. This is our webinar on building momentum and your role in influencing Canada's national codes and preventing falls in homes. To start today, and in honor of Loop Jr., we are going to start with a poll. It should be appearing on your screen right now. What population is your primary focus, adults and older adults? children, all ages, and across the lifespan. So please feel free to fill that in and uh, let us see what you, who you represent or who you work with the most. Okay, looks like older adults and adults is the biggest group, children comprising the smallest group, and many across the lifespan. Very good. Thank you for that. So it's good to know that working with the building code, um, we do the building code does represent all ages, not limited to any particular, it is a universal code. And we know from research that the best way to deal with falls in homes is to change the built environment. And in changing the built environment, we work with the building code. And luckily, our national building code process is an open process and we can participate. There are some challenges in working within that system, and I'm going to start there today. So for the first one, although health and safety are mandated in the code, there is some limitation to how much can be mandated within the code. 
And it seems that when it comes to public spaces, there is much more willingness or changes that are made um, to protect the safety of the public than when it comes to homes. It seems that it's a little begrudging when those, it comes to making those changes. In addition, most meetings within the process are open, but the most important meetings on policy are almost entirely closed, and that's unfortunate. I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. The other challenge is building code development is dominated by builders and others largely uh, devoted to maintaining the status quo. So that sometimes can be a challenge as well. In addition, the code as such is a minimum code, which means that there are several parts to the code and in particular part three deals with the larger buildings and certain occupancy types and is more um, dealing with the public part of the code. And part nine, it deals with the housing and small buildings. And this is the part of the code we are most focused on today because in terms of preventing falls in homes, we want to look at part nine of the code. So in dealing with the minimum code, it's not looking at you know, providing instructions or guidelines for building the best house or the safest house. It's just a minimum code that all houses need to be built to this minimum standard. So in public health, we're sometimes looking for more than that, but the building code is a minimum code. In addition, data expectations are different amongst the building community versus the public health community. And there is an overall lack of specific data um, tying, for instance, stair falls to the particular staircase and its step dimensions. So that provides a, it provides a big challenge, actually. In addition, the impact to the building industry, including their ability to make profit, is an acceptable criteria for code development. In injury prevention and public health, we're not used to that. For instance, with the Immunization of the School Pupils Act, nobody asked about whether or not there's profit to be made or profit impacted. It was deemed as a necessary thing and legislation followed. In addition, when we're working with the building code, there are some rationalizations that are commonly heard at the meetings and around the table. One of them that we hear a lot of is that housing affordability will be threatened if we look at ch making changes to stair dimensions, for instance, which requires more lumber and other uh, challenges to the builder. We want to be clear that we are very interested in keeping housing affordable as well, and the actual, um, actual, actual costs of increased lumber and a little bit of extra floor space is not actually as big as it may seem. So in addition, we have challenges or rationalizations that we hear, such as we've always done it this way. So a lot of builders, home builders, are very comfortable in the way they've always built homes and they're very focused on their client satis satisfaction and they feel that they're meeting those needs. And it's hard for them to shift out of that paradigm and have a different focus. And the one we hear the most that causes us some uh, consternation is that people are familiar with the dangers. Well, it would show uh, <laughs> the opposite is true if we look at the um, data around falls. If people were familiar with their uneven, uneven, ununiform stairs, they wouldn't be falling. But what really does happen in homes, stairways, and bathrooms as well? And we'll look a little bit more at some of these rationalizations I just shared with you further into our presentation. But now let's examine the size of the danger posed to users on stairways, showers, bathrooms, and toilets. Let, let's look at some epidemiology. So what are the injury consequences of missteps and fall? How familiar are we with them? And do we know their magnitude? So first, building codes have always dealt with a lot of fires in buildings. And we know that this has been some of the origins of the whole safety aspect of building codes. What is the injury toll from fires compared to other dangers? So if we look at it this way, you can see that fire, civilian fires, has a very small slice of the pie in terms of non-fatal injuries. Now this is U.S. data, um, and there will be a lot of U.S. data used in our presentation because unfortunately one of the data limitations is the lack of available Canadian data. But this is very good data, and the U.S. population is very comparable to ours. So you can see that there's definitely less fires. We're doing a good job with fire prevention, but there's a lot of uh, bath and shower and stair injuries. Here are some numbers. Our focus today on the issues will be roughly in proportion to the source of the injury. Fire will not be addressed. Now, if we look to um, some of the work done by Ted Miller in the Pacific Institute of Research and Evaluation, thank you for these slides, Ted. 
we see that in comparison for medically treated falls, you, there is a higher number of stair versus tub, shower, or toilet. In addition, if we look at hospital treated injuries, it follows the same pattern. If we look at um, costs per hospital treated injuries, we can see that toilet starts to overtake the actual injury prevention um, costs, so, or injury costs rather. So this was, um, if we start at the very beginning, so this is medically treated, this is hospital treated, this is hospital admitted, all, and all of those stairs lead. But the interesting dynamic is when we come to cost per injury, toilets lead. And when we look at the annual costs, stairs lead. And then when we look at, this is a nice breakdown, the cost per person annually. In terms of the distribution or breakdown of those costs, 11% is medical, 19% is lost work, 70% is quality of life. If we look at bathroom falls by ages, we can see it broken down here nicely on bathtubs and showers versus toilets, on um, by falls treatment, bathtubs and showers versus toilet. We have doctors in blue, ER visits in red, and admissions in green. If you look at the actual numbers, 77% of the 1.3 million professional treatments are for bathtubs and shower, 23% are for toilet injuries. And you can see on that slide, it's broken down by ages. And then here we can see that seniors age 60 plus accounted for 26% of all medically treated bathtub and shower related injuries, but they comprise two thirds of the hospital admissions. And for toilet injuries, seniors accounted for 80% of hospital admissions. And here you can see that the, in, in total, bathtub and shower users over 80 accounted for 32% of hospital admissions and toilet users over 80 counted, accounted for 47%. So summarizing some of the key epidemiological data, based on the U.S. data for this calendar or this group of years 10 to 2010 to 2014, seniors age 60 plus accounted for 26% of all medically treated bathtub and shower related fall injuries but they comprise two-thirds of the hospital admissions. For toilet-related uh, injuries, seniors 60-plus accounted for about 84% of the hospital injuries, hospital admissions. So um, I think we have a slide out of order there, so I'll skip through that one. Um, and I uh, think I will go one more. There are an estimated 1.3 million injuries requiring professional treatments annually for bathtubs, showers, and toilets in the U.S. for that calendar year. And again, the Canadian data would be similar. This is one-third of the 4.4 million comparable injury treatments related to stairs for this data to time period. And I'm going to turn it over now to Jake. Thank you, Linda. Um, just get the logistics sorted out here. Um, so I, I'm going to be focusing a lot on stairway safety based on the epidemiological evidence and the, the problems as well. Uh, there are also going to be a little bit of focus on retrofit ideas, and you'll see them against this blue background when they come out. There's a few of them. So again, most of the focus is on new construction uh, covered by a building code, and then there's some things we can do with existing facilities. So etiology, that's dealing with the causes of missteps and falls. So we're going to focus on causes now. And going back to that theme that uh, Linda brought up about rationalizations and flawed logic, uh, this particularly affects one, one class of problems. Those are problems related to traditional winder stairs. Uh, these are three steps per 90 degree turn, each turning 30 degrees. They're only allowed in Canada to come to a point like that. Uh, the U.S. requires uh, more uh, safe versions of winder stairs. So it's interesting looking at uh, how the U Illustrated User's Guide to the National Building Code deals with this issue of familiarity. It basically rationalizes some bad construction based on familiarity, familiarity of the users, and that's a very unreasonable uh, proposition, actually. <clears throat> Here's the text, for example, from that guide. Uh, according to NBC, sentence 9831, only one set of winders is permitted between floor levels. 
this provision is intended to keep the winders to a minimum in order to reduce the risk of missteps. Now, logically, if we just draw the parallel here, this is like having a law allowing an assault victim to be stabbed once, but not twice. Clearly, a truly rational law would prohibit even a single uh, assault or a single wound. Uh, so there's, there's a lack of logic in the building code right from the start there. So let's spotlight this traditional winder problem because I think it's quite instructive, and many of you probably have winders in your homes. Uh, it has two aspects. One is the non-uniformity of steps, and that's shown by those two areas of the winder, one uh, mark one, and bad handrail provision, particularly continuity around that 90-degree turn. And we'll, we'll get into more detail on both of those issues. And we're getting into the weeds now. So we're looking at a plan from overhead of a winder stair with three 30-degree winders, uh, known as the traditional winder. And there's a greatly increased risk indicated by those red disks. There are nine disks there, and they show nine places where a descending person would be very likely to fall and the risk increase for each disc is around 10%, or sorry, a factor of 10. So the overall risk is about a factor of 90 here. Uh, that's quite, uh, this is uh, data show that for non-uniformities such as we have here, um, it's not uncommon to have two orders of magnitude greater risk. And if you reduce the non-uniformity, that risk goes away. So we have this issue of people being familiar with the dangers. To what extent are they really familiar with the dangers, for example, of winders? Uh, back in 2011, I actually wrote a poem on this particular stair. Um, and I'm going to read the poem out. And it's called A Minute on the Stairway, A Lifetime of, Re of Regret. And you can read it yourself. We read from left to right. Once more, a stair must be climbed, a sweater to retrieve upstairs. Climbing yet again, the small platforms steeply stacked, demanding strength, heavy breathing now, pulling railing, almost there, quivering legs. Another summit achieved and sweater retrieved. Then, a quick descent, seeking railing, feet searching for small platforms, knees weaken, turning now on thankfully larger platforms. Whoops, reaching hands outstretched in desperate, desperate search. Oh no, unyielding floor, exploding brain, hours of darkness, a lifetime of regret. Again, that poem goes with the stair or any winder stair, uh, which are many examples across Canada in existing homes and still permitted to be built under the National Building Code of Canada. Uh, just returning to that slide, again, to reinforce that that risk is highly localized. And one of the things we would look into is not having the winders come to a point. That's why they're called traditional winders. Uh, the newer winders, which are required by other codes, uh, come to a uh, small minimum size, but not to a point. And so you get a, a helical stair, basically tapered tread occurring, and, and that's in the code. Uh, there's the exact language. It, was, it came into the National Building Code in 2015, and it basically requires a minimum 6-inch or 150-millimeter narrow end, n not zero. And when you do that, you basically create a helical stair if you have a complete set of wi uh, these tapered treads, uh, a, ta uh, a curved uh, stair with helical form. And you can see that it meets the 711 rule. Now, the 711 rule will come to later, but it's quite easy to do it with that curved stair. And here, the curved stair is replacing a stair that was originally planned for the, the townhouse which had much higher risers, 7.7 inch rise, 9 inch run. The improved stair has uh, two more steps, but at much lower rise, 6.75 inches. 
and a couple more treads at 280 millimeters or 11 inches. So it is all doable. And here's some examples. Now these stairs are in actual Canadian homes, so they're much, much more inferior to what I've just shown you on the plan. They're much steeper. Uh, the risers are higher and the treads are shorter. So that their risk level is, is high by probably uh, something on the order of a factor of 10 higher than the one I showed you on the plan. Now, here's one of those promised retrofit ideas. And it simply involves taking an existing winder stair with the traditional Canadian winders and putting two handrails in there that are continuous. And the one on the inside of the turn, shown here, is one that sticks out and it's, it's round and it, it, it's helical in form. So you can have a continuous handhold as you're going down and it, that handrail as it juts out into the stair forces you onto the safe part of the stair, which is the middle. So that's one solution you can, you can implement. Here's something that was done in a historic pub in Williamsburg, Virginia, probably hundreds of years ago, based on that uh, helical uh, handrail you see with, at the arrow. And that is intended to move people away from that steep drop where the, the winders come to a point. So there's a long history of doing this, and this is a solution, again, by way of retrofit, which this likely was, uh, for these uh, traditional winder stairs. Uh, here we see what's actually installed on the left in typical Canadian homes. Uh, if they have a handrail at all, some of them don't even have a handrail that connects the lower flight with the upper one. Uh, but here it drops vertically for uh, something on the order of 31 inches or 800 millimeters. That's four steps down. That's a vertical drop at that point. Now, another problem with this railing is um, it's a traditional shaped wood railing, and we'll, we'll discuss that next. And it's also too close to the wall, so it's very hard to even grab. And you can see the sequence here of somebody who's walking down. You have to change the position of your hand, somehow get around these 90 degree bends, and then hold on to this vertical railing that's ungraspable. Uh, so take home message number one. There will be four of them which is elimination of traditional winders for new stairs. And that would be a code change, and it, was, it went in as a request CCR, which is code change request 1248. So one of the things that should come out of this webinar is that professionals and other advocates for safety, particularly home safety, should convince the authorities in the National Research Council who are, who, uh, are the secretariat for the building code to make sure that this is at least discussed and processed for public review next year, which is the last possible, it's an 11th hour public review for the 2020 edition of the National Building Go to Canada. Uh, again, there'll be three more messages like this and we'll summarize them at the end. Now this situation introduces uh, the second of these uh, issues, which is handrail graspability. And again, your, your input on this to advocate for at least discussing these things and then uh, developing a code change next year for public review. Uh, let's just look at some of the, uh, the issues here. Um, both of those handrails that are shown in the photograph are ungraspable. They allow only an ineffective pinch grip. And on the left, you see what an effective power grip is. And these, both railings have problems with their mounting systems. They're dysfunctional. Uh, back in 1985, when I was with the National Research Council, uh, I commissioned a study done by the, uh, a group in Toronto, uh, brilliant researchers including Brian Mackey and Jeff Fernie, who are now with Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. And they looked at, uh, in addition to Handrail Height, which started in 1982 with other studies, they did the study in 1985. It was the first biomechanical study of handrail graspability and you can see that they went through quite a few shapes and sizes. The round ones, for the most part, all passed and were accepted by users and actually performed better biomechanically. Uh, uh, one of the square ones did. One of the oblong ones did. All the ones marked with an X failed. They were not even, uh, they didn't come out well in subjective testing and they failed in um, uh, performance testing. 
you can see the round one at the upper right. Uh, that was uh, very good. And the oval one, uh, which is circled there, uh, that one came out very well. And uh, the oval one is actually my, my all-time favorite for the hand-drill graspability. It's very easy to make, by the way. It involves very little milling. And here it is shown with an average adult hand, a male hand here. It provides excellent grip, and it's very comfortable to hold, particularly in the vertical orientation. And this is compared with a very standard hand drill section used widely across the U.S. and uh, to a slightly lesser extent in Canada. The unfortunate thing is where the Canadian builders do not use this, this uh, relatively uh, bad handrail, they use one that's even worse, or ones that are even worse in shape and size. So one of the problems we've had uh, fundamentally with the building code, there's always been a double lower standard for Part 9 facilities. And so what we need, we need to do is have part three of the code dealing with larger buildings and part nine. They, they have to work together on a common set of rules for safety, uh, particularly problematic issues like stairway safety, including the handrails. Now, th this means that it doesn't matter what kind of building you use, your hand doesn't change in size as you go from a larger building to a smaller building. Uh, so we have to deal with the ergonomics of grasp and that has not been done very well in Canada. So take home message number two. This is relating to control of hand drill size and shape for graspability. And there is a code change request that uh, was first submitted actually in 1992 and, and uh, the recent, uh, the current change is CCR 1328 code change request. And it really calls on having similar Part 3 and Part 9 handrail requirements to be processed for public review in 2019. Uh, so we should have a single standard for handrails because our hands don't change, again, from we, when we go from building to building. And this does address the needs of older adults and of younger adults, including children. We have to get better, smaller uh, handrails and better shapes. This has all been done, by the way, um, in the U.S., and one of the things that the U.S. has led in is on step dimensions. That's the next topic we're going to deal with. But this particular U.S. model building code, published by the National Fire Protection Association since, 19, since 2003, has had the improved requirements for handrails, as you saw on the previous slides, as well as the ones for better step dimensions, uh, according to what's called the 711 rule. That's 180 millimeters maximum step rise and 280 millimeters minimum uh, run. This was last addressed here in Canada three years ago with a two-hour web webinar sponsored by Parachute. There was massive uh, unprecedented support from, I think that we had a couple of hundred links for that during subsequent public review. And they were in favor of a change to make the stairs better, but uh, they, all that was on the table for them to comment on was a compromise change. So they said the compromise change, it's in the right direction, that's fine. But they wanted something better. They wanted the 7-Eleven, which is, uh, has been adopted since 1995 in Canada for public stairs. And again, we have this problem. There's no reason for a double lower standard for Part 9 for housing and small buildings. Again, we carry the same feet, the same capabilities. And indeed, in homes, we have extra demands for stair uh, geometry and, and so on, simply because of the wide range of ages and the, the uh, use conditions, sleep, um, all whole kinds of factors. They all go the other way. They say we should have at least the same standard in homes as we have in public settings. Now, I'm going to just run through very quickly some highlights of that two-hour webinar. Um, it's, we're squeezing two hours into about three minutes here. And um, myself and Alison Novak provided some of the technical input to this, and there were uh, uh, several other presenters as well. We're going to focus in on, first of all, the epidemiology. So this is a slide from that uh, webinar. And this is one of the couple of slides in this presentation today dealing with the epidemiology of uh, home stare related injuries what's the place of first or initial treatment? And you can see the doctor's offices and clinics, for example, uh, this is for the year 2000, I think, or 2007, somewhere in there. There were uh, nearly two 
million use uh, cases of medical treatment in a doctor's office or clinic. There were about 800,000 or less in emergency department treatment. 54,000 were hospitalized, and there were um, the fatalities are under reported in the U.S., but they were in the range of about 4,000, and here we see 1682. And so the total was 2.7 million injuries professionally treated. It's currently around uh, 5 million, so it's doubled in the last uh, nearly two decades. And you can see on the uh, column to the right of that the cost per case and how that rises. But even the lifetime costs, societal costs, for doctor's offices uh, injuries are nearly $17,000 over a person's lifetime. And you can see that's the largest component uh, on the rightmost column, uh, $32 billion in the, a year uh, at that time, uh, and that's 44% of the total of $72 billion. So it's, an, it's very instructive seeing how these injuries are treated and what the costs are eventually to society. And these figures come from Dr. Ted Miller, by the way, who's the world authority on this topic. And I've, I've just focused here on two of those cases <clears throat> of injury, uh, doctor's offices or clinics or emergency departments. And the two of them com combined, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, total 69% of the total in terms of number of cases. And they comprise, uh, I think it's 44% of the, uh, the cost. Um, <laughs> excuse me. The um, excuse me. It's good to drink. The um, that two um, uh, that uh, webinar in in uh, two years ago, three years ago also dealt with the design impacts as reported in a uh, NRC study on step dimensions in dwelling units, and you can see there just the different angles that the, the better stairs have their less uh, slope and the area difference. It's only on the order of uh, two feet longer to the floor. So it, it's a fairly minor impact, but it was enough to cause a lot of opposition from the builder community as well as some others. Now we're going to move from that to some laboratory tests which, which were done in the UK, and these have never been uh, paralleled anywhere else in terms of their quality. And they were done by two colleagues there, Mike Wright and Mike Royce at the Building Research Establishment in the UK. Um, they did laboratory studies of both function and preference, and they did a mailback survey of actual falls in homes. Uh, these have not been replicated anywhere else, so we have these data only to rely upon. Uh, the laboratory test had 60 adult subjects of all ages, and it looked at 10 run dimensions, ranging from 7.9 to 16.7 inch run, and rise at 160 millimeters, or 6.3 to 8.3 inches. Um, again, very wide range of stair conditions looked at. The findings are summarized in this graph. So horizontally, we have the run or going dimension, as they call it in the UK. Uh, ranging at the bottom, you can see from 200 millimeters to 425 millimeters, which is 7.9 inches to 16.7 inches. And in those, those various colors are various rise heights. They range from 6.3 inches uh, rise to 8.3, so a two-inch range of rise height. And you can see there, it's a very definite pattern, and lower is better on this graph. Now, we're going to stick with this graph a little bit. There's what's called the 7-Eleven stair, and that was, uh, there's a lot of research done on that, finished in 1974 by John Templer, who wrote the book on the subject. And so the first recommendation for the so-called 7-Eleven step geometry came from that work, although there were some precursors to that going back decades. And that was also the result of a decision by the Council of American Building Officials in 1993 uh, and they passed an explicit policy that all new home stairs in the United States should be built to the 7-Eleven step geometry. And that's a group of regulators who passed that. Uh, the vote, as I recall, was unanimous. And you can see that, looking at that graph, you can see two areas there. 
uh, from 200 millimeters to 275 millimeters, we have a fairly steep, steep slope there, which means that there's great improvement in performance. And the performance here is measured by the question, I felt safe walking down the stair. Uh, and then you see a, uh, a, a more horizontal portion between 275 to 425 millimeters. So anything you do on the left side of that graph to uh, basically reduce the, uh, the rise height and to increase, more importantly, the run dimension is going to have a uh, good effect. Here's what happened in Canada in 2015. After decades of debate on the topic, and I was certainly the, the protagonist for better stairs, clearly, um, the National Building Code of Canada only went halfway or partway toward that turquoise line, which is the 711 step geometry uh, for a run. And what we have to do now, what we should have done in, back in 2015, in fact, is to go to that turquoise line. You can see that uh, figuring in both the change in the run dimension and the rise dimension, there would have been a, a, a real big increase in the performance, again, to that question about safety. It would have gone from four to two, and that's a great improvement. Uh, I can't say it's a doubling, but it's, it's, it's essentially a very significant change in the performance of stairs as perceived by their users. And just the last uh, slide here with, with this graph, we shouldn't confuse optimum with minimum. We're not asking for optimum, which by the way is 350 millimeters or roughly 14 inches of run dimension. Uh, we're, all we're asking for is the minimum. That's where that uh, turquoise line is. So don't let anyone say, oh, you're asking for the optimum or the perfect or whatever. Uh, we all know that the perfect is the enemy of the good. And here we're not asking for that. We're just asking for something reasonable. If you want to know more about this, uh, Mike Royce and I had a discussion on this recently, and it's all on video. You can find it at the, my website, buildinguse.com. And it's a fascinating discussion amongst or between two researchers there about this very graph and the research behind it and the implications for design. Uh, just a brief word about the mailback survey they did. Uh, this was based on the question being asked about whether somebody had a fall on their stair during a two-year period in the UK. So it wasn't a preference study. It was an actual fall study. And they had people measure the stairs in their home and then report back. Uh, the results of that are very similar. The, the graph has the same shape as the one we've dealt with before on, on perceived safety and uh, it basically shows that the, the percentage of people who had a fall uh, on their stair, it's called an accident there, uh, goes down very drastically from the uh, left side to 20% of the stairs to roughly 2% of the stairs. And that's all based on just differences in the step dimensions. Now, again, the Canadian Code has only gone part way down that uh, to that area on the right, that's where public stairs are. And so we have a bit more work to do. Uh, we all have a bit more work to do on that. Uh, so you can see that in 2015, we, we got about three quarters of the way down to where we should be. Now, another way of looking at this is a table that was also presented in, in the webinar in 2015. And it basically looks at risk per 100,000 population of a hospital emergency department visit for a home stair fall. And you can see the risk goes from 20 per 100,000 population to 230 for stairs that you have in Canadian homes. It's a tenfold increase just for Canadian homes. If we factor in non-uniformity, such as we had with the winders before, the risk increases by another factor of 10. Uh, you can see there are the, we're going from 20 to roughly 320, based on what's called top-of-flight flaw. Uh, we, we, there's, a whole, there's old presentations on top-of-flight flaw, but this is what it looks like. Uh, something on the order of 30% of the Canadian homes, new homes, that is, on the market, have this problem. It's a very simple problem. There's a $10 piece of wood missing from the top nosing. So take-home message number three. 
is home stair rise run dimensions using the 7-Eleven rule should be adopted and we have to get that discussion cranked up again. And so we have one year before public comment and we only have a few months before the committee will stop considering this issue. And we'll have to wait for another five years after that. So if you're in favor of this improvement to new stairs in Can Canadian homes, uh, advocate for CCR 1232, which is the latest version of a proposal submitted in 1992. So, um, the take-home messages uh, so far are, um, you can see there are four of them, and we've dealt with two here, uh, sorry, we've dealt with three. We're going to move to um, grab bars and bathroom and showers, oh, sorry, bath, bathtubs and showers. There are four factors here. And we have transfers between sitting, standing, stepping over high obst obstacles and different surface elevations. We have underfoot conditions, including slip resistance and water. We have impact surfaces that are hard and unforgiving, typically very few if any upper body points of control available. So those are the factors. They end up with somebody lying on the floor like that uh, in a transfer from the tub. Um, now we're going to deal with factors one and two quite a bit here today, the transfers and the upper body points of control. And here are the mechanisms of a fall that would involve, for example, air step, slip, stumble, and trip in a compound misstep in a bathtub transfer situation. So it involves about half of the known uh, missteps. And this is some detail discussed at an international conference in ergonomics just recently. So these are personal factors in relation to, um, to missteps. And then here are um, physical factors. And there's a lot more work required on this. We could have a whole seminar just on the whole issue of misstep and fall mechanisms and how they relate to personal and other factors. But at least that work has started. Again, going to the fourth of these, these factors, typically very few of any upper body points of control are available right now in bathrooms, in home bathrooms uh, particularly. So all we're asking for is equity with stair handrails, and the codes usually require one handrail, and that's, all, that's what we're asking for for points of control for bathtubs and showers. You can see we're at the middle of that range of uh, between one and four points of control. And so we're asking for equity with a stair that has a single handrail. That's a pretty modest goal, but uh, right now we're at the bottom of that table. And all of this is based on research, particularly done in Canada at the University of Ottawa and the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute over the last 20 years. Uh, you can't go through all the literature, but here you can see the, the results there. They're quite clear in terms of their uh, their recommendations about the bars needed. There's two of them, one a vertical one uh, for transfers and then another one horizontal or diagonal for transfers within the tub. Here, we, uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly because we're running short of time. Uh, you can see the possibilities there. Um, there's, there's many of them in terms of location and the type of bar and whether it's a stanchion or a conventional grab bar. And if you have a walk-in or uh, uh, step-in shower like we have here increasingly in homes and hotel rooms, there's a very simple solution there. Here you see with the example that that's increasingly common. And just put a stanchion or pole there. And it's out of the way and it's used for transfers. So just to sum up, here are the options we have. Here's a minimum set. And this is based on work done at Toronto Rehabilitation Institute by Dr. Jeff Fernie on use of poles, uh, more technically called stanchions. And stanchions are widely used in uh, passenger vehicles, uh, have been for decades. And in Crete, you're seeing more and more of them in passenger facilities. And they're also useful for toilet transfers, getting in and out of the tub, and even transfers within the tub. 
One of the problems with conventional grab bars is they're not designed for water, so there's corrosion problems and problems of water getting into the, back, the wall for fit where the fixing is. And these are just some examples I've seen in the last uh, couple of months in, across the U.S. and Canada. Uh, now, here's some more of the promised retrofit ideas. What can you do without, uh, before we get these code changes? You can put these things in as a retrofit for under $200 for parts and labor for two of them, which is the minimum uh, requirement for bathrooms. Uh, one other um, mitigation you can do is uh, to solve the slipping problem. Uh, rubber mats do, are not reliable, uh, but what works is just an ordinary terry cloth towel when wet is superior to all other slip control measures both on floors and bathtubs and shower bases. And note here that in, the, in this installation, we have a stanchion there, and you can see it looks quite neat in terms of the, being supported by the tub wall. So aside from the uh, National Building Code of Canada having hotel requirements for grab bars, which are rarely implemented, uh, we need to get code change requests which date back to 2007 and 2015, Dr. Uh, Nancy Edwards and myself being processed quickly. And I now turn over to Linda who's going to put us back on time. Ah, great aspirations. Um, thank you, Jake. All right, so basically now we turn to the part of the presentation that we focus on your role. There are a number of ways that are officially set up and established for uh, public health and injury prevention personnel to get involved in the building code process. Obviously, it's very technically oriented. It has um, a lot of complexity to it, as you could see from the information that Jake presented. But basically, there are three main ways that you can get involved. So one of the things that you can do is you can get involved by observing meetings. That means that anytime there's a committee meeting, like the housing and small building meeting, that would deal with uh, safety in homes. And anytime there's task group meetings like the STAIR task group or the grab bar task group that deals with the issues we looked at uh, just previously with Jake, you can contact the technical advisor, the team lead for housing and small building, Najma Bella Rashid, and the information is there. And you can request observer status at one of the meetings. That means that you can hear that most of the meetings are done by teleconference, Canada-wide, and sometimes face-to-face, uh, -face, but predominantly teleconference with uh, screen sharing through WebEx. So you can actually see and hear what is being discussed at that level, whether it's committee or task group. And one of the things that's very nice is that although most of the discussion happens with the task group or committee members, there is an opportunity for observers also to share their expertise and insight. And that's very helpful um, to have as well. So, in addition to that, there is also the opportunity for um, becoming part of a committee or task group. Now that generally happens at the end of the previous code cycle, at the beginning of the next code cycle where committee uh, membership is established. So it's a five-year code cycle. We're coming to the end of this current code. So sometime in the spring of next year, you'll be able to go on the Codes Canada website and on the very left-hand side, pull down um, the option of submitting an application to become part of the standing committee. From the standing committee, there are task groups that are struck, and those then are also staffed um, or filled by persons not just within the committee, but also you can apply to sit on that. And then they will let you know if you have been chosen. So it's predominantly at the beginning of the code cycle or the end of the previous cycle, but it does sometimes happen during the code cycle and you can apply online. If you look at how the um, National Building Code is structured, just to give you a visual of what some of the process looks like, you can see here from this flow uh, chart that um, there is uh, a commission above all, sort of the top organizing and uh, decision-making group. And um, you'll also denote that in this uh, graphic I've put any of the meetings that are closed in orange and any of the meetings that are an open process in green. So their meetings are open. There you could you know, request observer status for any of the green meetings. And they also have an executive committee that um, has some open and some closed meetings. Below that is the standing committee on housing and small building that I've referred to that I am a member of um, that makes all the decisions re uh, regarding home safety. In between, you'll see um, to the very right, there's an orange provincial and territory policy advisory committee 
that is the one I referenced at the beginning of our presentation, that their meetings are all closed. They have representatives from all the provinces and territories in Canada, and that is unfortunate that we do not have any sort of input at that level. Uh, but they are very involved, and the idea is that whatever is decided at the national model code level, that those that code is then taken into the province and um, territory's own code and becomes law and would be implemented then locally by building inspectors. So there are a number of standing committees, not just housing and small building, there are many more, but the key one in terms of the public health and injury prevention um, professional um, sort of purview would be in terms of home safety is the standing committee on housing and small building. And out of that arises task groups and sub-task groups and work groups. So for instance, the STAIR task group is dealing with all the STAIR issues and uh, the grab bar task group is dealing with the bathroom safety. So um, if we look at how the committees um, are uh, comprised, there is a, a matrix that's generally followed. So there is geographic representation from all areas of Canada um, and they, there's also um, a, different types of professionals that are included. So there's regulatory personnel that would be building in fire officials, industry is represented, um, there are some ex officio non-voting members whose expertise contributes to the work of the committees or groups. And then the one in purple that I've changed to purple is where we would fit in as public health people. We're considered general interest. So when the committee is, uh, matrix is filled, that's the little slot we'd be slotted into. And just to let you know, there are only two general interest reps um, for the current Housing and Small Building Committee, um, and I'm one of them, but I'm the only public health person. So for all of Canada, for the work that's being done, there is only one of us currently. So and another role that you have beyond just observing the meetings or getting involved by applying to be part of committees or task groups, you have a role in terms of the public review process. So once a year, most commonly in the fall, there's a release of CCRs, and actually they might occur during other time frames, but for our intents and purposes, it's predominantly the fall public review process that we're focusing in on. And this is open across Canada. So they post the proposed change. There's an opportunity to folks to sign online and um, make a comment to support the proposed change and or not support it and also make comments. So for this particular fall, and by the way, this is where a lot of public health and injury prevention professionals did contribute to the last code cycle. Jake mentioned it earlier in his presentation. So, so basically, if you Google Codes Canada, you're, you're going to be linked to the correct website. Their website address is a little bit long and, and convoluted, so that's your best bet. You'll see there's online forms, and it's organized by the particular code change request or the proposed change form in terms of the language for the new um, code that they're proposing. So for this fall, there is one injury prevention public health uh, proposal coming up, and that has to do with pediatric window falls. So if you have an opportunity this fall to go online and log on and uh, comment on that and support it, that'd be great. We will try to use distribution lists amongst um, from the online, uh, from the Loop community and others to share information about dates. So basically the issue is that the current code allows for homes to have windows down low even at floor height and children are falling through and being injured at significant rates. So the code change that's being proposed will require windows to be installed at a higher height or have some type of guarding or restricted opening to prevent these falls from happening. Now the bigger public review process that you'll want to participate in if you can is going to happen in 2019. During that public review process, we're hoping that there will be um, code changes code proposed for the 711 step dimension improvement, for the winder issue, for the stair rail graspability requirements, and for the bathroom safety grab bar issue. So again, if you, if you Google Codes Canada and go online in the fall of next year, you should hopefully have an opportunity to comment and support these particular proposed changes. They have not reached the stage yet of being converted to um, a proposed change form or new language in the code. It's still in process, and it is a bit of a battle of competing priorities to be able to get these, these things moving forward. So many of you have asked to be involved but aren't able to observe meetings and aren't able to apply for membership or aren't chosen. And so for those of you who are very interested and very keen and passionate about the topic, there is an opportunity for you to um, share your concerns about the public health issues 
um, and to get in touch with uh, the uh, commission, which is the top body, and request that injury prevention items be given priority in the remainder of the code cycle in order to make it to the public review process in the fall of 2019 and thus be included in the 2020 code cycle. And you would share those, uh, you would send those emails to the chair of the commission via the secretary. So just to review, then those would be the things that Jake talked about in the elimination of the traditional winders, in the control of the handrail size and shape, in the rise run dimension, the 7-Eleven step dimension, and of course in the provision of grab bars for bathroom and showers. So you may re recognize these slides. He provided take home messages with the actual code change request information on it. And um, there is one for each of the things. This is the handrail. This is a stair dimension, and this is the provision of grab bars for showers. And also, here is the person and address you would send it to. So the current chair of the Canadian Commission on Building and Fire Codes is Doug Crawford, and he would be reached via email via his secretary, Ann Gribben. And there is her contact information that will be available to you when you're sent the slides as well as today and as well at the YouTube video. And that is an, uh, another unofficial, it's not part of the things that are linked on their website, but that is an opportunity for those of you who really wanted to get involved and were not able to participate in the other three venues of um, sharing your concerns. So I want to thank you, and I will turn this back over to Marielle. Perfect. Thank you so much to Linda and Jake for their wonderful presentation. And um, it's, a, it's a nice opportunity for me because they're actually here in my office, so I'm able to put names to faces and uh, work with them directly while a lot of our presenters usually come online um, remotely for us. So um, we're going to move on to our question and answer period. We still do have a few minutes. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. And I will read them aloud, and we will have uh, one or both of our presenters um, answer them for you. So we do have one question. This is from Kara Zukovic. Uh, is there a link to find out who is on the Provincial Advisory Committee for our province? Um, sorry, I, I have no idea. I've actually never seen a list, and I think it varies because um, it is based on politicians and their representatives and ministries, and they sometimes choose to send other representatives. But I'll turn it over to Jake. Yeah, you should use that same address for Ann Gribben, the email address, because she uh, serves the Provincial and Territorial Policy Advisory Committee. So uh, one, one stop call there. Perfect. Thank you so much for our presenters for answering. So if there are any other questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box. And uh, as Linda had mentioned just at the very end of her presentation, um, both of our presenters I think are very happy to use our Loop platform to continue the discussion and uh, hopefully to uh, further inform everybody who is on Loop about the, um, uh, the, the process going forward into next year. Okay, so we'll give it a couple of more minutes. Uh, and Marguerite is just reminding us to um, get the email for Ann Gribben, I believe. And is that on one of the slides here? Perfect. So we're going to have Linda come up here to um, put some. Perfect. So the uh, blue, perfect. Um, the blue bar at the bottom there on the current slide. It's ann.gribben at nrc-cnrc.gc.ca. So everybody should be able to see that on the slide there. Thank you very much, Linda. And we have a comment from Jamie O'Rourke saying, it's a great webinar and it was very helpful. Thank you so much, Jamie. And I see on the webbing platform we have a Ben Barco with a hand raised. Ben, if you could type, type your um, question into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen, that would be great. You should see a little comment bubble there. That should open up the chat box. I am looking for you on the audio line, but I can't see where you are to unmute. So it would be great if you can um, type your question into the chat box. Uh, 
Um, so question from Ben. Thank you very much for typing in there. I believe uh, he is asking what experts helped um, help with the submission. And we're wondering if you're referring to the code change request, Ben. And Marguerite's also commenting um, whether we would like people to post about this on Facebook. Um, I think the general consensus is yes, sure. Uh, depending on how active you are on Facebook, it would be great to um, spread the word. Oh, I th believe Ben is looking for the credentials of the submitters. Uh, this is Jake. Um, the uh, credentials of the submitters uh, are on the, uh, the CCR form, and I'm not sure how public they are, but if you want to have a copy of any specific um, CCR, and, and they're all identified in the record, uh, you would ask Ann Gribben. She's the top secretarial person, and then she could email you a copy of the, uh, the code change form, which includes the submitter uh, credentials and who they are and so forth. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, another question from Bernadette Hymas. Has there been advocacy at the level of medical officers of health in Ontario and other provinces? Great question. I would love to see that happening. Um, we have had some discussions about it. Uh, we have sometimes, um, you know, had someone who was willing to take it forward, and it hasn't really materialized in, in a large way. Um, we do have um, a medical authority officer um, out from BC who's worked with us in the past, and it's definitely something we would like to see, but so far there hasn't been any sort of official um, v venue for making that happen. And uh, medical officers of health from across Canada representing the various provinces and territories, I think it was around two or three years ago, uh, developed a position paper with help from people like um, Nancy Edwards and others uh, to develop a position paper specifically on the riser tread issue. And they basically uh, advocated uh, uh, and gave a lot of evidence for the change to go forward. Uh, so I'm not sure what, where that is now, but the, the, that was an effort a few years ago. Great, thank you. Um, and I believe Ben has um, uh, clarified his question, so thank you very much, uh, Ben, for typing uh, your question out again in the chat box. What credentials of a submitter has best impact? Uh, I, I know Ben very well, and hi, Ben. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think the, uh, the best credentials are that you're a uh, uh, um, uh, a public health professional, whatever role that is, uh, who has direct contact with the problem and the people who are having the problems, in other words, the population at large. Um, in my role, I, I do not, unless they're injured and uh, there's a lawsuit or something. But uh, the, the, um, the, uh, I think sincerity and y your position, your, your passion and so on, uh, in prior public reviews, that all come, came across very effectively. Uh, you're real people. You're dealing with real problems that are often ignored. And if you can put that into your credentials, I think that that's, that goes a long way. Wonderful. Thank you, Jake. Um, we do have another question from Bernadette. Uh, could you provide a link to the national position paper or uh, note the title? Um, I, this is Jake. I assume you're dealing with the national position paper on, uh, of the public health officers. Um, I think the easiest way of getting that, I, I, I maintain a file which would have that in it. And I'm not sure whether it's the final version, but uh, if you email me via my website, you can get my email address there. Um, then I, I can perhaps dig that out. But um, be aware that my archives are very large and it would take some time to find that specific uh, item. Great. Thank you very much. So um, it is 1.04 p.m. right now. Uh, if there are more questions, um, I think it would be great if we could 
um, bring this discussion back onto loop. Um, so you can feel free to ask your discussions there, and both of our presenters uh, are on loop, so they'll be able to respond. So I'm going to um, put in our, our plug here for the loop community of practice. Um, you can join us at www.fallsloop.com. And I'd also like to share um, information about our new online community of practice uh, called Loop Junior. And uh, this is um, for uh, anybody who has a passion or who is interested in uh, children's fall prevention. So you can join us at the link on your screen there, www.jr.fallsloop.com. And if you're already a Loop member, uh, you can easily um, uh, have it a, create a membership on Loop Junior as well uh, with your current and existing profile page. Uh, so once again, I would like to thank both of our presenters, Linda and Jake, for a wonderful presentation and um, on uh, such a, a practical topic. Um, and I think everybody was able uh, to um, everyone learned a lot and was able to take away a lot of uh, action items for the rest of this year and next year. Um, as well, thank you for all of our all of our participants for today for joining us and engaging in a great discussion. Um, please do not close this window just yet. Wait until you have been redirected to the next screen where there will be a brief evaluation survey and that will launch directly in your browser. Uh, we always appreciate if you could provide us with feedback so we can continue to offer high quality webinars. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. See you next time.